learning, learning heaven's value system is, uh, is like bigger than more important. You, you, we learn it through recognizing the presence of God. The greatest gift in our life is the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that compares. The person of God is called the down payment in Scripture. The Bible says, I don't understand, it's an incredible mystery, but uh, it says we inherit God, and then the down payment is the Spirit of God himself, which means here's a payment and there's more coming. And you know by, you know how much God trusts what he has done in you by what he has entrusted to you. And when we discover that the Holy Spirit has been entrusted to us to dwell in us, to lead in us, to rest upon us, we realize that he has great confidence in his work of salvation in our life. And he's given us or called us into this into this relational journey where we actually need to partner with someone. One of the, I, th I, think, I think the most important verse in my life in the, in the last quite a few years, maybe a couple of decades, has been this verse in John 15, seven that says, abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask whatever you want, it'll be done for you. As you know, it's not a verse where God is inviting us into finally having our way and having anything done, you know, in some selfish or egotistical manner. Instead, he's inviting us into a co-laboring role where we get to actually have influence in participating with him to see his purposes accomplished in the earth. It's all about the presence. It's all about the person of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a, a movement, it's not just an energy, it's not just a power, it's actually a person that we have the privilege of coming to know and recognize. See, the Holy Spirit lives in every believer, but he doesn't rest upon every believer. He lives in me for my sake, but he rests upon me for yours. Living as an offering, living, living as a, a surrendered, yielded offering to the Lord gives a platform, if you will, a place for the Spirit of God to rest because he knows that in us giving ourselves to him completely, we won't try to manipulate or use him for our intended purposes. And in this bizarre journey that all of us are in, we have this shocking discovery that he actually meant it when he said, whatever you ask for will be done. It's, what I'm about to say is, is scary for us as leaders, and it's easy to get heavily, heavily criticized for what I'm about to say, but it's, it's important at least for you to think about this. He did not make us robots or computers that were programmed to request specific things. He made us people who could think and feel and would go with him on a journey, and in the journey, and in surrender to him, learn to dream in a complimentary fashion to his dreams. I'm not, I believe in praying what he says to pray, so don't, don't misunderstand this. You know, if he leads you to pray in a certain way, that's, that's the most powerful prayers. But there are sometimes he won't, he won't talk to me. Sometimes he won't tell me what to do. And it's never punishment, he is never silent out of punishment. He's only silent when he's already spoken, and it's our job to remember. He's already deposited the seed. What have I done with it? See, it says, Mary treasured these things in her heart. So when the Lord speaks to you, there has to be a process where we embrace and treasure those things that God has said, because they germinate in us. There's a time of fulfillment, and they germinate in us. And there are things that the Lord has spoken to us that, uh, that have, to be, they have to be treasured. And, and uh, one of the things that I do is I, I try, I try to keep uh, extensive records of whatever the Lord has spoken you know, over my life through the years. I've, I've been in real tough situations where I, I literally just sit in my recliner. I had a health issue several years ago and I just sat in my recliner at home and I wasn't able to eat, I wasn't able to, to do very much. I just sat there and I just listened to 
prophetic words over my life. I watched on little videos that I have in my iPad and just, because I can't afford to think thoughts about me that he doesn't think about me. If I entertain thoughts that he's not thinking, I'm entertaining a lie. And when you believe a lie, you empower the liar. Sometimes we, we, we dwell on lies as an attempt to be humble. We dwell on lies because we feel less about ourselves and we think feeling less about ourselves is humility and it's not. Believing a lie is never humility. It's much harder to believe the truth fearing that people will think you're arrogant. See, great faith is always thought to be arrogant by those with unbelief. And great faith never draws attention to itself, but it is willing to take a stand on the heart and nature of God, the word of God, the covenant of God. So the Lord has brought us into this journey and he says, if you abide in me, that's living in the felt realization of the presence of God. It's the felt realization of a person. I'm not just talking about emotional highs and lows. Th those fluctuate. But there is, there is the capacity in every believer to live in continuous contact with the person of the Holy Spirit. As Larry Randolph told us years ago, he says, if God is as big as he says he is, he shouldn't be that hard to find. The felt realization of presence. So here it is, abide in me. It's, the picture is, a, is a, a vine, a branch on a vine. So there's that, there's that connection. You can't tell where the branch starts and the vine ends. You know, you, you, you can't tell this. It's, it's so seamless. It's so interconnected. And abiding in him is living in that felt realization of the person of the Holy Spirit. So we try to exercise faith for many things as we should. You're praying for that loved one that's dying. You're praying for that breakthrough at work. You're praying for that lost neighbor that doesn't know Christ. And we work hard to exercise faith as we ought to for those things. But how about exercising faith to discover his presence? See, he is faithful. Faith, full. And when you are close to the one who is faithful, you become full of faith. It's all from a person. It's not through a strategy. It's not a secret. It's not tricks of Christianity. It's, it's confidence in a person, his nature, his heart, his word. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come from having heard. Faith comes by hearing. It's a present tense reality. It's in the continuous fellowship with him, that heartfelt uh, realization of presence. So abide in me, he says, and my words abide in you. That's the intentional embracing of whatever God says, putting it deeply in your heart so that it can germinate. It can, you can meditate on it, think about it, re-examine it, look it up, study it. But you take that which God has spoken. And when you get those two realities, living in the heartfelt, the, the felt realization of presence, and the intentionality of embracing whatever God says. Those two realities put you in a position to ask whatever you want, to be a force in the earth. Four times in three chapters, Jesus said, you can ask for anything you want and it'll be done for you. And oftentimes as pastors, what we do is we, we try to dumb that down because it's so scary. You know, what he really meant was, if you ask for what he tells you to ask for, then he will answer that prayer. And that is true. I've had him lead me in very specific prayers. But again, there are times where he is silent because he's wanting, he's wanting whatever is in me to stand up. So the scripture says, arise and shine. Get off your rear end, stand up, take your place and shine because you have a responsibility in the earth. And the end result of changing posture it's not self-confidence. It's a God confidence. It's a confidence in the word of God. There's something about shifting and changing that posture that the end result of that is kings will come to your light and nations to the brightness of your rising. There's something divinely attractive of a people who know who they are in God and who God is in them. Amen. 
Every one of us have the measure of his presence we're willing to jealously guard. Whatever measure of presence you'll take a bullet for, that's what you're living with. And you say, well, I have, I have all of God, I have all of those Holy Spirit, and, and I get that. Theologically, there are things that are true that are not true in our practice. So I like to put it this way. I have everything in my account. I have some things in my possession. That was a really good point, Bill. I, I thought that was excellent. Yes, it's all in my account, but it does me no good if I can't access, display. So here we are as a people called to host and to carry this wonderful person of the Holy Spirit into life itself. You all right? Good, me too. Excuse me. That's the will of God for my life right there. <laughs> so I, I, um, I'm fascinated by, by Jesus' example of cooperating with the Holy Spirit. It, it just, uh, it, it never gets old. It, I, f- I feel like, and I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way. I, f- I look at these things and I feel like, man, I'm just barely out of preschool in this subject. And, and yet I'm so, uh, I'm so hungry to learn and to see more of what he would actually do in and through me, in and through us. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus is, is walking down this road and he's got people crowding in all around him. And um, they're all wanting to get close. They, they all want to be the, the, the one who could say to their grandchildren, man, I was there. I was there the day he walked through town and we saw what he did and heard what he said. Everybody's vying for position, you know. The reputation of his profound messages, the reputation of his miracles, his signs, his wonders had spread so, so deeply that the entire city is pressing in trying to get close. And he's, he's walking down, conversing, I'm sure healing, doing all the stuff that he does. And in one moment, he feels a woman uh, touch the edge of his garment, which is really a, a, a strange moment if you think about it, which I'm sure you have. It's a, everybody's touching him. There's a touch and then there's a touch. And this woman who was seriously ill touched his garment and Jesus felt presence leave him. Now, let me rephrase that. It wasn't that something left him, it's that something flowed from him. Because he still had the spirit without measure. All right? He, he, had, he had the Holy Spirit without measure. So it wasn't like I had something and now it's gone. It wasn't that. He, he lived with such an awareness of this person, Holy Spirit, that when there was movement of that person from him to another without his, without him directing traffic without him releasing through a command or whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't initiated by him. It was initiated by the faith in this woman. So she touches him and he feels, he said, somebody touched me. And the disciples are a little bit stunned by his statement because everybody's touching him. And he ignored his disciples, which he knew exactly when to do that as they objected, you know. And he said, no, somebody touched me. And he looked, and the, and the woman was there, and she was dramatically healed. Your faith is healed. It's a great story, but what puzzles me is how can you be in conversation with people, noisy streets, lots of activity, more than Christmas at Walmart. <laughs> lots of activity. And he's walking down the street, and he's so conscious of this person, Holy Spirit, that when somebody put a demand on what he was carrying, he was aware of the release. So that's what I'm jealous for. That's, that's it right there. And, uh, and we see throughout Scripture, we see, um, we see a number of times throughout Scripture when people, people lived in that reality. Peter's maybe one of the better examples where he's walking down the street going to a prayer meeting, and uh, people were aware of when he would walk down that street, so they brought the sick, and, 
and lay them in the street and his shadow would pass by. There's no substance to a shadow. It's not like, it's not like a prayer cloth or something. It's not the same as the laying on of hands. It's actually, it, it's actually proximity. See, your shadow will always release whatever overshadows you. As we give place to this person, and again, it's not us just directing him. It's us cooperating. And sometimes he makes us conscious of what he's doing. And we get to participate with prayer or decree or whatever it might be. But there are other times it's literally just us doing life. But there's such a, a, a glorious manifestation of his presence upon a person that their surroundings are profoundly affected. For me, these stories are invitations for exploration, for experimenting. Now, I, I know the, the subject of experimenting bothers a lot of people, but it's the only way I know how to learn. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to learn any other way than to experiment. We, we just try to get it right. And uh, when we don't, we clean up our mess. When we get it right, we give him thanks. But it's, it's experimenting. You know, you, you go to Apple computers. They have two major parts of their corporation. One is research and development. The other is manufacturing. Manufacturing, you want zero defects. But if your core value is zero defects in research and development, you won't invent anything. You actually have to explore what won't work. It, it's a part of the journey. You have to actually explore them. And in these two realities, the manufacturing, zero defects, and research and development, manufacturing is character. We want zero defects. Research and development is power. We want to learn how to cooperate with him to see things happen and break through. Risk is involved. I remember uh, pastoring in uh, a small community in Northern California, uh, the name of Weaverville. And I was there for 17 years and we, we loved being there. I figured I'd be there the rest of my life because not even the devil expected anything out of that city. <laughs> 3,500 people on a good day, you know. And it was the big town in the county. So if you can imagine a county that's 40 miles wide by 80 miles long and just all rugged mountains and there's this little gem of a town and that's where we lived. But I figured, you know, we could, we could ambush the enemy because he didn't expect anything. So size is never the issue. Jesus actually fed more people when he started with less bread and fish. And he had more leftovers. The less he started with, the more he did. Never be impressed or intimidated by size. He thinks different. So I remember um, our office was downtown and uh, across the street was a health food store and behind that was our post office. And we had no mail delivery. We had to pick up our mail every day. And I remember walking uh, to the post office to get my mail from the office. And, and I remember walking back, I would come to this health food store. And it was the kind that, that it was a wonderful store, wonderful people. But, you know, they had some weird religious stuff in there too. You know, the gurus and all the weird things. But, uh, but the owners were friends, and re I really loved just uh, talking with them and finding out how their business was doing, encouraging them. But I, I remember I'd, I would walk back from the post office, and I'd come, up, I'd come up to the back door of this store, and I would just stop for just a moment and become conscious of the Holy Spirit. You will always, you can become conscious of the Holy Spirit if you'll turn your affection towards him. You will actually discover the one you love if you love. And I would come and I'd just stand at the back door just for a moment and just be conscious of the Holy Spirit upon me. I didn't, you know, I didn't 
seeing how great thou art or you know, anything. Well, it wasn't that, it was just taking a moment to become conscious of him. And then I'd walk into the store and uh, I would usually go in and get some lunch, you know, and take it to my office. And, but I'd walk up and down the aisles like this when what I wanted was over there. But I figured I was kind of like one of them rainbird sprinklers that was just trying to take the glory of the Lord into every aisle. And, and uh, I, I'm not saying you should do this and there's no good verse behind it. So work with me here for a minute. But I remember one day walking into the store, the owner, uh, he said, hey, Bill, come here. And he took me over into the vegetable section. And he said, he said, Bill, when you walk in the store, something is different. Now, I didn't have more of God in my life than all the other believers that shopped there, but I might have been the only one that intentionally became aware of the Spirit of God upon me before I would walk in. You know, you, you don't go in and do weird things. You're not going, you, you know, you, you, you're, not, you're not laying hands on people as you go. It's, it's not that. It's, it, it's not, you, you get no prize for being weird, all right? <laughs> but you can be the landing place, the resting place of the Spirit of God. And when we do that, every place we go is affected. Atmosphere changes, not because we willed it to change, but because we invited the one who changes things. We became the donkey that he rides on, if you will. We're, we're, just, we're just simply the yielded vessel that he would rest upon. Peter's shadow healed the sick. For Paul, it became so, so obvious and so... The, the effect was so profound that they could take cloth, headbands, and aprons off his body and send them to another location and demons would cry out and leave the person's body or they would be physically healed. It, there was such, and, and I remind you, it was headbands and aprons, work clothing. Now, I, I think it's great to lay hands on prayer claws, and I do it. And we send them out, and we pray for folks. I, I believe in that. I have no problem. But this was actually clothing that a man who built tents sweat all over while he was working, and they took those articles of clothing. In other words, his, he, was, he was so offering himself in labor unto the Lord that even his manual work carried anointing to deliver and heal. It reinforces this idea that once you're a believer, there is no secular occupation. And if you find one, don't do it. Everything is honestly sanctified, set apart to the Lord for him to fill it. He will always fall upon sacrifice. And if you work as a mechanic, offer your labor unto the Lord because the fire, the presence of God rests upon what we offer him. It's that manifest presence thing again. <clears throat> so I look at these stories of Jesus, I look at the stories of Paul and Peter and how they hosted this person, the Holy Spirit, and I, I, get, uh, I, get, I get jealous. Maybe jealousy is the wrong word, I get hungry. Did you know that Jesus, Jesus, first, number one, is eternally God. Never stopped being God, never took a vacation from me, God. But the great mystery of scripture is he became 100% man while maintaining his 100% divinity. I can't explain it. But Jesus told us of himself. He said, the son of man can do nothing of himself. I have looked it up, and the word nothing there actually means nothing. <laughs> he, he, was, he was telling us, he was letting us know that all the stuff that he was about to do, the miracles, the deliverance, the walking on water, the multiplying food, all the stuff that he did, 
he couldn't do. Now, obviously, as God, he could, but he, he so restricted his activities, his, his processes, he so restricted them that, that he could only do what he saw the Father do if the Holy Spirit helped him to do it. It's another good point there, Bill, just, uh, <laughs> just don't quit. The Son of Man can do nothing of himself, so he chose to so restrict what he could do to give us an example that could be followed. See, if he does everything, you know, if he multiplies food, you know, as God, if, if he heals the sick as God, I'm still impressed, but I'm not compelled to follow. I'm, I'm permanently the spectator going, yay, God, do it again. But when I find out he does it as my savior, as my elder brother, then suddenly I discover, now wait a minute, he's setting an example that can and must be followed. And I, and, and I, I may never do it well, but I don't have another option. I can't say, well, I'm just not gifted. Don't be stupid. Excuse me, don't be stupid. That's really the right word. That's, that's the right word, sorry. I was right the first time. So Jesus only says what he hears the Father say. He only does what he sees the Father do. To give us an example that can and must be followed. But there were two qualifiers, two qualifications in his lifestyle. Number one is he was without sin. Number two, he was completely empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So number one, without sin. How effective is the blood of Jesus? Does it take care of most sins? Big sins? All. So the first qualification is settled. So the only other question that remains is how empowered by the Holy Spirit am I willing to be? So when, the Holy, when Jesus illustrated this lifestyle that he was inviting us into, he would walk into a room, he would walk into a, a, into a crowd, and they would say, we've never heard a man speak like this before. And in John 6, he tells us the secret behind what he was doing. In John 6, verse 63, I believe it is, he says, my words are spirit and they are life. My words are spirit and that spirit gives life. That's contrasted with John chapter one. John chapter one verse 14 says, Jesus was the word of God made flesh, but when he gets to John chapter six, the word of God is made spirit. I'll try this out over here. <laughs> As I heard somebody say recently, the word of God made flesh. <laughs> then the word of God was made spirit. His words became spirit and that spirit gave life. So <laughs> yeah, nice. It's a little late, but it's all right. It's all right. I'm a forgiver, I'm a forgiver. So if you could picture this with me, whenever Jesus spoke, he wasn't just sharing ideas and concepts. That was absolutely true. But there was power behind it. Let me be more specific. There was presence behind his words. Presence behind his word. That's why there was atmospheric shift every time he spoke. And think about this. In Romans 14, 17, it says, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit. So if words become spirit, that's why the kingdom became manifest wherever he talked. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, God's answer for the sin issue. Peace, his answer for the torment issue. Joy, laughter is medicine, is the healing agent. 
triune salvation, the healing of the whole man is involved in this reality of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom? It's not a location. It's actually the influence of a person. Kingdom, king's domain, wherever the king has dominion. Yes, there's heaven, and I believe we go to a location, but, but Jesus' profound teaching and practice was to illustrate the reality of that world here and now. That was, that was what, that's why they killed him. They didn't kill him because of good services, sermons. They killed him because of the demonstration. Because they, they couldn't handle, they couldn't duplicate what he was doing. They were losing influence because somebody actually could demonstrate what they said. They'd not been accustomed to that at all. So Jesus would speak and what would take place? Atmosphere would change. What was it? The kingdom of God. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, if I cast a demon out of you by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God came upon you. So here, let's just say we've got individual, he, he comes delivered from the torment of devils, all right? So he becomes free. Jesus just gave us an understanding of what actually happened that we couldn't see. We see a tormented person that is now free. Jesus said what actually happened was the kingdom of God, the reality of God's dominion crashed in to this place, this uh, abiding place of darkness, and it broke that darkness, and the darkness had to leave. In the same way that when you turn a light on and darkness goes, that's actually what happens in that deliverance. As light comes, darkness leaves. So Jesus is illustrating the profound effect of the kingdom of God on life as we know it. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added. If you will prioritize the dominion of God over every part of your life and your influence, then you can be trusted with all things. See, we love it when people seek first the kingdom. We're not always as happy with them when God adds all things into their life. We love it when people uh, pray in secret. We're not as happy with them when God rewards them openly. We love it when people give in secret. We're not as happy when God rewards them openly. We love it when they humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. We're not always as happy with them when they are exalted like he promised. And the reason is we have a theology for death, but not for resurrection. Yieldedness to Christ is supposed to lead to something. And there's a sanctified demonstration of what it is to live life in an effective way. And that's what we're called to. And if you want to be criticized, start exploring what it looks like to live in the presence and power of resurrection. (laughs) I need another drink after that one. (laughs) Pastor gets pulled over for weaving down the road. This really isn't a very good story. policeman pulls over and says, Pastor, you've been drinking? He says, nope. He says, what's in that bottle? He says, it's water. Policeman takes it, smells it, goes, that's wine. And the pastor said, he did it again. (laughs) Not the best story. I apologize. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. So Jesus, whenever he would speak then, just picture this. He's got a group of people sitting in front of him, and he, he, he tells them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent actually means to change the way you think. It's change your perspective on reality. It's like Jesus says, here, I brought my world with me. And if you don't change the way you think, you'll live your entire lifetime within hand's reach of my world, but never, you'll never access it. It's not that we access through the mind, it's just faith doesn't come from from the mind. Faith comes from the heart, but the renewed mind is like banks of a river. It creates a context for faith to flow. So Jesus says, 
repent. So here's the crowd. He stands before all of us and he says, repent. The kingdom is within reach. All right. In his speaking, words became spirit and that spirit contains kingdom. So whenever you say what the Father is saying, you change the options of the people who hear you. I have more jokes if that would, if that would be better. I've, I've got pages and pages of them. Every time we say what the Father is saying, we tap into the heart of God and he gives us the privilege to speak words that change atmosphere. How many of you have been in a real tif- difficult situation? Maybe in a hospital waiting room or somewhere and it's just really, really rough and there's so much anxiety. And somebody, maybe a relative, a friend, a pastor, somebody walks into the room and makes a statement and the entire atmosphere changes. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's that moment. That's that. You, you may not sit back and say, wow, the kingdom of God is present. But there's an atmospheric shift that took place because somebody, whether they even knew the Lord or not, somebody tapped into the heart of the Father and they released that word and it changed the options. All of a sudden, people who are discouraged find courage. People that have no hope suddenly have great hope. Why? Because somebody spoke in a way that changed the atmosphere, it released presence. And that presence, that person contains the kingdom. How are we doing for time? Because we're, we're still going to pray for people. I, I, uh, I preach the eternal gospel. So uh, I don't know what to say. If you get through before I do, just go home, I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus speaks and things change. Here's a great example. In uh, Matthew 10 and Luke 9, I believe it is, but you'll you'll recognize the stories. Jesus got his guys together and he's sending them out two by two. And he says, uh, when you go into a town, let your peace rest, uh, find a house, a worthy household, let your peace rest on that house. (laughs) I think this is funny, excuse me, but I, I, I can see the disciples sitting there going, I didn't even know we had peace. <laughs> and how do we get it out on this house? You know, but Jesus had to do it. So there was sent out and he says, release your peace on the house. And Luke's gospel adds to it. He says, and if there's no one there worthy to receive it, it'll come back to you. <laughs> got it, got it. First of all, I don't know how to get rid of it. And I'm not sure how I'm gonna recognize when it comes back. But it's actually a partnership with a person because peace in the kingdom is not the absence of something. See, in the world system, it's the absence of noise, absence of war, absence of conflict. But in the kingdom, it's it's a person. It's the presence of a person. So Jesus would walk into a situation and would speak peace and the atmosphere would change. So now he's telling his guys to do the same thing. Well, there's this interesting story in the Old Testament And I'll just read part of it to you. He sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. The dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot and she returned into the ark to him for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And so he put out his hand and he took her and drew her into the ark to himself. No, I had no other relationship that we know of with any animal in that ark like this. To himself. He waited another seven days. He sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. What's the international symbol of peace? It's the dove with the olive branch. What did Jesus say to release over the house? You're not communicating a concept. You're partnering with a person. A person that is looking for a place to rest. That's your assignment. That's your life. 
So the dove came to him in the evening. Behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. He waited another seven days and set out the dove, which did not return again. The more we become aware of the person of the Holy Spirit, the more, the more we become aware of his activities and how he moves, how he works. How else, how else do you know when you've actually released peace and how do you know enough when it comes back? You, you get the, the dilemma. And yet this was ministry 101 for Jesus. These are the 12 disciples that aren't even born again yet. They're not even born again yet. They couldn't be saved because Jesus hadn't died. He hadn't shed his blood yet. So he's teaching 12 guys that are not born again how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Ministry 101. Now, if you turn in your Bibles, and we'll wrap it up with this passage, go to Gospel of John chapter 20. Now, do you do that with every verse, or you just like that one? <laughs> You're just happy I actually opened the Bible. That's what, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. All right. I, I quoted scripture. All right, give me, give me some points here. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. Can you just stop for a moment? <clears throat> I, I know this is a very familiar story, but it illustrates actually what I've been talking about all, all night. Jesus, the disciples are, are afraid they're next. They saw, they saw Jesus crucified and they're scared to death, they're next. And so they're hiding. <clears throat> Jesus walks apparently through the wall, which doesn't help when you're struggling with fear. <clears throat> it's, it's not the best way to encourage the brethren. You know, a knock on the door would have been helpful, I don't know, but anyway. He walks through the wall, he just appears, and he says, peace be to you. <laughs> Let me tell you something, that dove could not find any place to land. <laughs> we, we, we got 11 guys left, and they are terrified. They're, <laughs> they, they are anxious on steroids, all right? They, they are anxiety filled. Jesus walks in, and he says, peace be to you. Verse 20 says, when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So in other words, they were not happy campers when he first walked in and said, peace be with you. But he showed them his hands and his side, showed the scars. And see, he didn't look like he did before. Um, I'm going to open a can of worms with this, but I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> Jesus has a habit of showing up different then we are accustomed to seeing him. And if we measure things by externals, we, there's a good chance we will miss what he's doing. But if we learn to recognize him by presence. I remember my first trip to Toronto and the outpouring that took place there. It was confusing when I walked in there. It was 5,000 people there. It was confusing. I closed my eyes and it was the same same presence of the Spirit of God we were experiencing at home. It, it, see, some, all of us have lists. Most of us have lists. I've seen God work this way. Yeah. Weeping in the presence of God. Maybe uh, rejoicing. Maybe uh, trembling. Maybe kneeling. You know? And we have this list. And when God starts doing something that's not on our list, it really challenges us because we tend to measure what he's doing by our accepted experience instead of by presence. So when you recognize he's here, it, it doesn't mean you fall for everything. It just means you realize 
he's sponsoring some things that is outside my experience. And pe people will often criticize what's being done, and the backstory is God would never do that to them if he had never done it to me first. That just felt good to say. You don't look so happy, but I, I felt good. I felt good. Right. So then they were happy when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I personally don't think the disciples had a clue what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 10 when he said, release your peace on the house but they got it here. They got it here. They're filled with anxiety. They're scared to the max. Jesus walks in. They are all the more aggravated and nervous. He speaks to them. They don't recognize their moment. The God of mercy gave them a second chance, spoke again. And this time, if you can imagine, the dove flying around the room, finding people to rest upon. In other words, the whole mission was to release a person. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were designed to live in the manifest presence of Jesus. That's the design. And everything we do in life is to reconnect us with design. Living in the manifest presence. <clears throat> to me, the exciting thing about this is that when, when we learn to host him, more amazing things happen by accident than ever used to happen on purpose. You, know, you, you actually stumble into success, if, if I can use that term. You, you actually stumble into miracles. You know, I, I don't know that when Peter walked by the sick people and his shadows touched, I don't know that he leaned any more in their direction or tried to, you know, I, 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 assuming he was just walking to a prayer meeting. But somehow, in his history with people, somebody must have seen a healing take place because they were close to that individual and they recognized the spirit of God that rested on him. And so they spread the news and people started planning around his activities just to be close to the man who hosted the person. <clears throat> I'm trying. When I go to sleep at night, I crawl into bed, I, I like to turn my affection towards him. I, I'm not wanting to start singing songs. I, I don't want to activate, overactivate my brain. I'm not interested in staying up, interceding for the nations. I want to sleep. <laughs> right, so let's, let's, let's get it clear. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a spiritual giant, change the world. I want sleep. <clears throat> But in, in that moment, as I drift off to sleep, I like, I like to just turn my heart of affection towards him because he's such a lover. He's always drawn to affection. And I like, did you know that your day begins at night? In, in, in the creation, it says there was night and day, which was the first day. Most of us would have better days if we had better nights. <clears throat> and, and it starts when you get into bed. That's when your day begins. Your day begins with rest. And learning to just acknowledge him. Again, I'm not trying to get into some intercessory role or some prophetic thing. I'm just, I'm just wanting to make sure that my conscience is clean, that I'm connecting with the person of the Holy Spirit, that as I go to sleep, he will train me in the night what I couldn't handle in the day. <clears throat> I 
this kingdom, this person, this presence <clears throat> is released through three basic ways that I understand. There may be dozens more, but I, I, I get three of them. <clears throat> One is through touch. Laying on of hands is not a symbolic act where you show your sympathies to somebody who needs prayer. There is another world inside of me that is longing to be released when I touch. And the woman who touched Jesus, whether she could have explained that, her heart of faith understood there was something he was carrying that she needed to access. Whether it's in the touch or whether it's in our touch, there's supposed to be release of presence, release of kingdom. <clears throat> I'm going to end with this, so let me just wrap this up, and then we're going to pray. <clears throat> so the first would be touch, laying out of hands. The second is decree. One of the mottos of our house is nothing happens in the kingdom unless first there's a declaration. And you guys follow those, those same principles. Things need to be said. <clears throat> Not just happy thoughts. They actually need to be declared. Why? Because words become presence. Things, things need to be said. And there's actually a release. You know, Jesus to the centurion said, go your way, your servant is healed. He sent his word. He made the decree and the servant was healed some miles away through a spoken word. That doesn't mean we get to craft whatever word we want to make whatever thing happen that we want to make happen. That's, that's the wrong emphasis. The emphasis is on hearing him so that we can represent him. <coughs> Decrees change reality. <clears throat> and the last one is what we refer to as a prophetic act. That's where you do something in the natural <clears throat> that, has no, that has no correlation to the outcome you want. For example, <clears throat> the prophets lose an ax head as they're building their new dorms for their ministry school. And they lose this ax head into a river. And they come crying to the prophet saying, we lost the ax head, we can't afford to buy another one, and it's, we, you know, it's in the river. And the prophet says, take a branch, throw it in the river, he does, and the ax head swims. How many of you know you can throw branches into a river all day long and you're not going to get an ax head to swim to you? It was a divinely directed action that was unrelated to your intended outcome. And when we learn to just simply obey because God said to do something, and, and I realize whenever I encourage people to do this, it invites people to be weird. <laughs> but some of you will get it right, so it's worth the risk. <laughs> some people just like to do weird things just because they're weird people. Not you, it's that other church, but it's, it's, I've seen it happen. <clears throat> so if you can imagine praying over something and the Lord says, strike the ground in this location. But you don't have to understand it. I know my wife was praying regarding the drug trafficking on, on, uh, in California on I-5, the, the interstate. And uh, people would go from Seattle and Portland, Oregon, down to Los Angeles or San Francisco and through our town. And so she began to do certain prophetic acts, whatever the, she felt the Lord had her do. And she would, uh, she would do these prophetic acts and, you know, crazy, all of a sudden these drug trafficking U-Hauls or whatever they are would break down in town. Or they would be pulled over some, for some minor traffic thing and they would find all these drugs. Why? Well, there was a connection. There's a connection to just raw obedience, doing whatever he says to do. You don't do it for recognition. It's not about, it, you know, here, I, look at me, I took this bold action. No, you, you keep it dialed down and you just do what he says to do and then you watch. We had one, I'm, I'll, I'll end with a story. We had one guy that was, uh, he was a drug addict and he was demon possessed <clears throat> and he was driving from I think it was Seattle to, La, to San Diego. So it's, it's like 600 miles on each side. Redding's in the middle. And he was driving to San Diego to get some help. He, had, he, was, he was just tormented 
to the max. And he, um, he, was, he was driving, and when he got to the city limits, in his car, he's, he's alone in his car, when he gets to the city limits, the demons in him begin to manifest. And he pulls his car over to the side of the road, and he literally starts running down the side of the freeway because he, he drove into a realm of anointing. Now, I wish I could say everybody you know, has that experience. I'm just thankful whenever we see it happen. He drives into this realm of anointing, and he, he, the demons in him begin to manifest. He gets out of the car, he cries out, he starts running down the side of the freeway, and Jesus literally met him and delivered him from drugs and torment, from demons, on the side of a freeway. He was completely set free, and there was nobody there. But there had been people there praying, doing prophetic acts, doing whatever he said to do. It's all about a person. We have the amazing privilege of walking into a house and letting our peace, that person, remain on the house. That's our assignment. Why don't you stand? One of the stories that moves me most in this, in this area of study is Jesus, as it should be, Jesus and his relationship with the Holy Spirit. It says, um, it says when he was baptized in water, he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove, and in John's gospel says, and remained. So Jesus' initiation into this lifestyle, if you will, was in his water baptism. So he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes upon him in the form of a dove and remained. So. If I have a dove sitting on my shoulder, how am I going to walk around this room? Carefully is the most common answer, which is true. The reality that he's called us into is that I have to move around this room in a way that protects what I value most. In other words, every step is with the dove in mind. Every action, every word, every step is with the person in mind. We're going to pray for this second in just a moment. Um, but I'll tell you, the cry of my heart right now is to see us together ache and long for more of that manifested presence resting upon us in such a way that, that everything in our life is affected by this person. So let me just ask you, take the next minute or two, and I'm going to ask you to pray. And I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. Keep your quiet prayers for Starbucks. <laughs> I don't want you just thinking happy thoughts. I want you to take the cry of your heart. I want you to put it on your lips, and I, I'm going to ask you to pray. And then in a moment, I'm going to pray over you. And then let's just see what happens, all right? But go ahead. Just lift your voices. Just begin to pray. Ask the Lord specifically regarding what we talked about tonight, all right? And so lift your voice.
pray loud enough that you can hear yourself pray. You don't need to yell. No one needs to scream, but I want you to hear yourself. Casual prayers get casual answers. So, Father, our cry is for an upgrade, an upgrade in, in our awareness of you, our awareness of your presence, your heart, just the way you manifest yourself, the way you speak, the way you move. We just want to be like the sailboat that holds the sail to catch a wind. We, we want to move where you're moving. We want to yield and cooperate with you, be participants what you're doing in the earth. So I'm asking for an upgrade of this house an upgrade upon all of our lives together that, that we would wake up in the night, in the morning, aware of you, conscious of you, moved by you, stunned by your willingness to display yourself strong upon us. We pray this for the honor of the name Jesus. Just put a hand on the shoulder of somebody next to you and just pray, God, give them double what they asked for. <laughs> just give them double what they asked for. Just give them great, great increase. Great increase, Lord. Great, great increase, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just tell that person, I bless you in the name of the Lord. Beautiful. Go ahead. You can drop your hands. We're going to pray together uh, for the sake. You can turn the lights up if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Why don't you give the Lord uh, some praise, some thanks. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do it again. We give you thanks, God. We give you thanks. We thank you. We bless you, we honor you. Wow. Now we're going to pray for a, a number of conditions tonight. In a few minutes, I'm going to bring my team up and they will give words of knowledge. We'll identify who they are. We'll, we'll, words of knowledge are where the Lord helps us to see what He's doing. And we simply call those out. So we're going to pray for a bunch of folks that way. But first, there's a couple things I want us to do corporately. There are people here who have suffered with different kinds of head trauma. And uh, uh, it could be sports injuries, uh, automobile uh, accidents, falling off ladders, whatever. But there's head trauma. And you have suffered with issues of, of memory loss, of concentration, has just affected the way you've done life ever since the accident. And uh, we have seen extraordinary numbers of people, including complete amnesia healed, partial amnesia, facial features restored to normal after uh, this prayer. So anyone who has any kind of head trauma and, uh, and you, you're ready for Jesus to heal you, put your hand up, put your hand up high. Any kind of head trauma, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't be shy, please. Uh, I don't want to persuade you. All right. All right. We've got quite a few. All right. 
There's, a, uh, there's a, quite a few folks here just by law of averages. Uh, there's quite a few folks in the room that have loss of hearing. Loss of hearing. Um, so. <laughs> It's that third grade sense of humor, I'm telling you. It gets me into trouble all the time, all the time. Any measure of loss of hearing, you may wear hearing aids, it just may be uh, through, uh, we've we have, have had people you know, that were in war uh, next to artillery that went off completely stone deaf that the Lord Jesus recreated, opened their ears. And, uh, and I believe that the Lord's gonna do that tonight. So anybody with any measure of hearing loss, put your hand up high. Yeah, hand up high. All right, good. All right, cool. All right, if you have hearing aids, when we pray, pull them out so the, the people that can pray. And those of you that are going to pray for them, do not lick your fingers and stick it in your ear. I have found people don't like that. Now, if you're confident God wants you to, ask for their permission first. Don't, don't, don't ask for forgiveness later. Ask for permission first. And then uh, the other thing we're going to pray for, uh, let me just throw out right now, there's, some, there's a number of folks that have an injury or maybe it's a deterioration in the right hip specifically. And I don't know if, uh, if there's like um, a hip replacement that is scheduled or maybe even you had the surgery and it hasn't gone well, but there's something with that right hip. So if that's you, get your hand up and, and let's get this. Let's get this healing for you. Any, anybody else with that right over here? Right, we got several. There's somebody also that has an issue of the rib on the right side that's, uh, I think it's out of place or perhaps it was broken, hasn't healed right. So get in on this, it's, it's free, all right? Um, but the thing I wanted us to, to target is there's a number of folks here who have broken bones in the past. Could be a week ago, it could have been 50 years ago. The oldest injury I've seen healed was a broken tailbone after 72 years. The woman was dropped as an infant and lived with this deformity, this pain her entire life, and Jesus healed it. And uh, so anyone with uh, a broken bone that did not heal correctly, put, uh, put your hand up and we're gonna pray for you, all right? All right? Anybody want a broken bone that doesn't heal? Okay. We, we have that gift as well, so that's it. All right, we're gonna pray together. This is, this is what I like to do. Uh, whenever we pray for the sick, we do the same at home. When we pray for the sick, we almost always have the church join with us in ministry to people. Because it's not about somebody, it's about his body. It's about, it's about us doing what he's called us to do. And it's not a confidence in your gift, it's a confidence in his. And, uh, and so all of you that raised your hand for anything I just called out, put a hand up right now. Put your hands up. Now, okay, look around you. And if I want you to go to somebody who has their hand up, but listen carefully, don't start praying till I tell you to. All right, I need to make sure everybody has somebody ready to pray for them. So go to someone. If you can't uh, get to someone, then at least extend your faith towards somebody who's receiving prayer, all right? So do that quickly. Just stand quietly next to them. And then uh, uh, I'll uh, give you further instruction. All right, now, you can put your hand down once somebody comes to you. And if the person you're about to pray for still has their hand up, would you pull their hand down for them? All right, it's hard for me to see, so let me ask this. Shh, shh. I really do want to make sure everybody has somebody ready to serve them and that nobody leaves with that rejection thing because nobody prayed for them. So if you have your hand up and nobody is there to pray for you, would you wave it at me? That'll be a little easier for me to see. First of all, up in the balcony, is there anybody we missed? All right, down here, anybody on the main floor? Is there somebody right over here? All right, we need somebody right over here. Thanks, excellent. All right, now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I believe very strongly in praying in tongues, but sometimes the simplest prayer of faith in English changes things. And uh, for me, the tongues is the intercessory part, but there needs to be a decree. You'll, you can't find anywhere where Jesus actually prayed for the sick. He would declare them well. He would confront the power behind the sickness. And uh, we already know it's the Father's heart to heal. So we're not, we're not here to persuade him. He is already persuaded. 
He's trying to persuade us to get involved in what he's doing. And so we're going to pray for these folks. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Very quickly, those of you that, that need the miracle, just tell them briefly, um, I have a loss of hearing in my right ear. They don't need to hear the whole, whole story. No, they don't. The broken bone, they don't need to know what color of truck hit you in 1955. They just, all they need is to know what's broken. Okay, shh, 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 shh. hold on. So find out where, where the problem is. If it's a proper place to lay your hand, put your hand on the problem. Somebody in the group, put your hand on the problem. All right? And then I want you to begin to pray. And as your own courage increases, speak to the problem, command it gone. All right, so Holy Spirit, we welcome you. I ask that you'd come now in great power and demonstrate the wonder of Jesus through miracle signs and wonders. I pray even those who are doing the praying would get healed. All right, go ahead and find out what to pray for, and then I'll give you a couple minutes. Thank you, Lord. Now speak to the bone to be reset. There's a broken bone that didn't heal right. We just speak to that. We just say, Lord, you're the one who makes all things new. So do your creative miracle in that uh, there's somebody in that left leg, uh, broke the leg, it did not heal correctly. I think it's the bottom part of the leg. We just declare the healing grace of Jesus over that, uh, over that leg now. Speak to the ears. Command deafness to be gone and for the ears to open. Command them open. In Jesus' name, deafness be gone. Ears be open now in Jesus' name. Now. Okay, you got about 15 seconds. Okay, go ahead and end your prayer, but stay with the person. No hit and run. We want you to, we want you to stay with the people, all right? Shh. Now, Jesus ministered to a blind man twice before he could see clearly. Remember that. He, he saw ministries walking, and then he did a second time. So I want to always be ready to pray a second time whenever it's needed, all right? I'm going to ask all of you that receive prayer... This part right now is as important as was the prayer. This is where you put faith into an activity. Faith actually needs an action. Sometimes I've had people just walk to the back of the room, then come and see me, and they'll be healed in the journey. It's not that it's a noble action, it's just an action. Faith needs an activity. So I'm going to ask all of you that just received prayer, even if you think it's impossible for you to find out what's happened, I want you to move around, check yourself in some way. If there's loss of hearing, have somebody whisper. Maybe uh, back off a distance and talk to you. See if, there's, if it's a pitch, a uh, high pitch or low pitch, the loss of hearing, then have them, just tell them so that they can examine with you. What you want to do is you don't want to ever, you don't ever want to coerce someone into pretending they're well. That, that's, there's too much pressure. Too, too many people pretend, and this is too special to pretend, all right? So just examine yourself. As soon as you see that you're at least 80% better, I want you to wave both hands over your head like this. Do it for about 10 or 15 seconds. We've already got people up here doing it. Right over here. Right over there again. Another one over here. Up top over there. My goodness, up there is more. More. <laughs> Right over here is a bunch more. It's amazing. Right here. Thank you, Lord. Some more up there. Wow. Okay, now, everybody just don't clap because your moving hands confuse me. I like the clapping. But for this one moment, just quiet. And everyone that just got healed, at least 80% better. And I say 80% because sometimes things start and they take place over the next few minutes. It says of one gentleman that Jesus healed, said, and on his way, as he was going, he got healed. So there are times where the seed begins to, uh, to sprout 
and it takes sometimes several minutes. I've even seen several days. But uh, all right, so everyone that just got healed, at least 80%, wave both hands over your head. And the rest of you, look around the room. Look around, the, look at this. Look at this. That's tremendous. All right, beautiful. You don't have a very good memory because I told you not to clap. You're just too happy. That's the real problem here. Just way too happy. Isn't that wonderful? Turn and pray again. If the person you pray for is 100% better, don't pray again because you might mess them up. Just <laughs> leave them where they are. Um, but if there's another area to pray for, you might want to have them pray for you, something that wasn't mentioned. We'll do this one last time, and then I'm going to bring the team up, okay? So go ahead and turn and pray for that person one more time, unless they're 100%, like I said, then maybe have them pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Okay, about 10 more seconds. All right, you did good. You did really good. You can stop the prayer. Now, one last time. In fact, let me do this. Everyone that received prayer, those of you that got breakthrough the second time we prayed. You couldn't wave your hand the first time, but the second time we prayed, just examine yourself right now. Those who got healed the second time we prayed, I want you to wave your hands over your head. Because I want people to see, look, look at the, the people that got, that got that touch from God the second time. All right, right over here. That's beautiful. Now, everyone that was healed tonight so far, just wave your hands like this. Just wave your hands. Thank you, Lord. All right. Now, let, let me ask a question. We're going to do oh, one more thing. I keep saying one more thing. This is part B of the last one more thing. Yeah, whatever. All right. Um, I, I meant to do this earlier. All of you, how many of you with the head trauma thing, you can already tell there's a difference? I realize some things have to be measured over time, but you can already tell things are different. All right, how many of you can't? Put your hand up, because oh, I want to see. Please be honest. All right, we have a number of people who can't tell any difference yet. When the head is healed, oftentimes there's, a, there's almost like a lightness or a, a, a heaviness is gone, a clarity of thought, even colors uh, change, the way people see, perceive things, shifts and changes. So here's what I want you to do. If you prayed for somebody with head trauma and they couldn't wave their hand, Put their hand on their head right now as though there were a steel band on their head. I, I know it sound, this will be the prophetic act, all right? So turn to that person right now and just put, put your hand on their head as though there was a steel band. Do that now. And then I want you to lift it off and just declare over them, this ends tonight. This ends tonight. Now just lift it off. Lift it off. We just declare this thing ends tonight. This head trauma that has tormented people, this ends tonight. The memory loss, the, the migraines, the ongoing headaches, blurred vision, difficulty in concentration, that all ends tonight in Jesus' name. All right, how many could actually tell a difference on that prayer? Let me have you put your hand up high. I wanna, I wanna see who you are. You could, you could tell a difference, yeah, right up here. Anybody else? Because all we wanna do is cooperate with them. Right, here's another one, yep. Yeah, beautiful. All right, go ahead and take your seats. And uh, I, I won't prolong this, but I do want to make sure that we have opportunity to see a lot of people healed. And uh, so, Michael, if you could grab that mic and uh, let's get our students up here real quick. Just stand right down there. Now, I'm going to ask you... Um, we're gonna do this part quickly, but I, I need you to help me. When they call something out, a condition that you have, please put your hand up quickly. Don't wait for a second confirmation. Imagine Jesus calling out your condition, inviting you to a miracle. Respond accordingly. 
And then when they're through, we're going to pray again. At the very end, I'll have the team up here and any from this house that wants to join to pray for folks for the situations that we didn't call out. But we always want to start with what we see Jesus doing and then move with that, all right? So go ahead. We'll just do this quickly. Okay. There's a middle-aged man and you've got kidney stones, which are being healed actually right now. Yeah, so who was kidney that? stones, all right? Just as soon as it's called out, just put a hand up so we can see who you are. Okay, go ahead and call out the next. All right, someone over here. All right, go ahead. Someone, someone with a knee with arthritis. Arthritis in the knee, okay. Someone that has burned their hand or fingers on the stove in the kitchen. Okay, all right. Very specific. A burn injury. On this um, on top. All right. Someone that has got an injury on your knee as well, I believe it's your right knee, um, from sports injury, potentially skiing. Okay, does that make sense? All right, right here. All right. All right. Go and ahead. Tinnitus, which is the ringing in the ears. All right. All right. Impaired sight in the left eye. Impaired sight in the left, left eye. Difficulty with sight in the left eye. Okay. A man who I think is there's he has blonde hair and he had a broken tibia from a car accident. Okay, is there a, a man here with a uh, had a broken tibia in a car accident? And then put your hand up. And if your hair is blonde, if it's not blonde, we'll pray it turns blonde. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Anybody with that, just put your hand up real quick. All right, go ahead. Um, someone with a neck injury with pain going into the shoulders from a car accident in okay. involving a red car. Okay, all right. Any, all right, right back here. All right, another here. Um, and a woman in her 50s or 60s with a right ankle that's swollen and discolored is a sign of, of a further disorder, but that's like a symptom of it. Okay, all right, if that fits you, put your hand up quick. Go ahead. Uh, scoliosis. All right. And razor burn from shaving. Oh. He cares about everything. That's amazing. <laughs> Issues with the lining of your digestive tract. Okay. All right, right there. Yep. And All then right. clicking in your right elbow. I feel like it might have been metal. You had a surgery, you had metal, and it's it's off, and your right elbow clicks. Okay. Hand up quick, right over here. Yep. All right. Uh, gastroplatic uh, syndrome, so it's kind of like a reflux acid lining problem in your stomach. Okay, if that's you. And then yep. problems with the uterus or, um, yeah. All right, if that's you, put your hand up, yep, go ahead. Uh, you're on dialysis, so your kidneys are failing. Okay. And then uh, a regular heartbeat. Uh, on, on this kidney failure thing, if it's you, obviously get your hand up. But if you have a relative, uh, then I want you to stand in for them. We see a number of people healed through proxy. Finger or fingers cut off the work accident. You might be a carpenter or something like that. Okay, put your hand up. All right, go ahead. And left ear being damaged and maybe through, through something like an explosion. Okay, hearing left ear damage through explosion. Okay. Plantar fasciitis in your right foot. I believe you're a male over the age of 40. All right. If you're a woman, get in on it. Just sneak in. <laughs> just sneak in. <laughs> Vertigo, and you almost didn't come today because of the symptoms. Ah. Be cool to get that healed, huh? Yeah, right over here. Come on. Tonight's your night. The condition that makes your veins in your body get inflamed. Ah. All right. Does that make sense to anyone? Wave your hands. Okay. Go ahead. And um, hearing loss that comes from a genetic syndrome. syndrome. A, a genetic disorder. Okay. Go ahead. You have arthritis in your left hand, and your Achilles tendon um, was torn through sports injury. All right. That's right here. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you have a lump either on your arm or your shoulder. Um, and I believe there's someone who's been suffering with severe abdominal pains. I think you might be a woman. Okay. All right. Either of those, right? Right over here again. Um, something with your esophagus. 
I'm not sure what, what that is, but. Um, and then um, uh, hip hyperextension. All right. Does that make sense to anyone? Back over here. All right. It's hard to see, so I can't tell. All right. Um, all of you that put your hand up for anything, please stand up. How many of you believe Jesus still heals people today? Yeah. yeah. Amen. All right. I knew the answer to that already. You just got to be praying for people. But how many think he's big enough to do it through you? Ooh. Not quite as good a response. Here. The question is coming, so get ready. How many think God is big enough to do that miracle through you? All right. I want you to go to somebody who is standing. We're going to take this uh, one time, and then we'll have ministry down at the front. But I'm going to ask all of you that are standing, put a hand up. Keep it up until someone comes to you. Those of you that are sitting, please help us. You're the ministry team right now. Go to them and to find out what they need prayer for, and then minister to them. should be praying by now. Speak to the condition. <clears throat> okay, you got about fifteen more seconds. As soon as the person you prayed for, you can tell they got healed. You ought to do what that group just did. Just start clapping so we can see. Just, just have them check themselves. Yeah, just start. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, have them examine themselves right where you are and start clapping when you see uh, that person healed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I said once, but turn and pray again. We'll, we'll get, we're going to wrap this up, but I want you just to pray one final time for them right now. Just do it right now. We, we want to make sure that everybody gets what they came for. We don't want it just in their account, we want it in their possession. Thank you, Lord. Okay, go ahead and wrap up your prayer. Now, let's, let's do this. 
Examine yourself. You know what to do by now. Ex do something, even if it seems silly. Just do something, please. And uh, if you need to climb stairs, come climb these. I don't know. Do something, or, or climb those. Just, just do something. Move around. Um, if you had a hard time with concentration or seeing, open a Bible. Do something to challenge yourself, because you always want you want to discover what God has done. You don't want to just be captivated by what has to happen. All right. That's really where the increase comes. All right. All of you that got healed tonight at any time, I want you to wave both hands over your head like this. You know, look, look around the room while you do this. Look around the room. All right. It's amazing. Thank you, Lord. Now, we called out a number of different things. How many of you had hearing loss restored? You had your hearing restored. Put a hand up high, wave it so people can see. Look around the room. Look, all these, all these different ones with hearing loss. Goodness, there must be at least 20 people. Let, what, did anyone have at least 50% hearing loss that just got restored to you? Wave your hand at me if I want. I want to see right over here. More than 50%. All right, anybody else? Just wave your hand. Right over here's another one. Right over here's another one. Right down here. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Is, is that amazing or what? Are you, are you happy about that? How about, how about head trauma? You could notice a distinct difference in the way you think or see or feel as a result of prayers. Wave your hand like that. So this is a big deal to me. This, we've seen so many miracles. We had a young lady that was literally was dying. She had a systemic lupus of the brain. She was hit in the head when she would sometimes pass out for up to 30 days or 60 days. Uh, when she'd get up in the morning, her head would be swelled large and she would, it would take hours for the swelling to go down where she could even go in public. And, um, and one of our guys had a word of knowledge, prayed dramatically healed. Her mother said, you look like you did before the accident the next day. She went on, I think it was to Cambridge University and got uh, her degree. She was, her life was over and she was dramatically healed of this head trauma thing. So this is, we've got to go after this stuff. So. Yeah. What else got healed tonight? Anybody have a bone reset? a bone that you had a restricted movement or pain, and now you have full liberty right here. You know what, let's, I would like to have, right over here's another one. Let's, we got a couple minutes, right? I would like to hear two or three people anyway that just got healed of the bone reset, the hearing loss, tinnitus, I, tinnitus. yeah, your ears stopped ringing. Yeah, they were ringing. In the, yeah, so let's get a half a dozen people up here to give testimony, and then we'll release you, all right? Come on up here. Michael, help me out. You can all sit down, and uh, listen, before you were saved, you were just leaving the house at this time of night. So, uh, so we just, you know, we just got started here. At, at home, we had to go ahead and face, uh, face the, the audience, face the people there. At home, we had one of our elders said, we need to change the name of the church to Denny's, always open. It's just all, always. One of our elders said, we only bring a watch to church to see if the date changed. So uh, I'm not threatening you, I'm just telling you my history, all right. So let's hear real quickly what Jesus did in these in individuals. Michael, go ahead. So I was born with a genetic hearing loss. I'm pretty sure I can hear all the things that I couldn't hear. And um, I came in with really bad plantar fasciitis and I like it hurt just to walk in. And now I don't Come on. have any pain. Beautiful. 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 Go ahead. Um, I've been dealing with stomach and digestive issues for the last 10 years, and it's like the woman in the Bible. I've paid and tried everything, and the Lord spoke to me. Tonight is the night. It's done and over with. Now you have all the knowledge, but you're healed, and it's done. I had a football injury that ended up breaking my, fracture, my femur, 
and it never healed properly. And I would never be able to like bend correctly. It would always crack and pop. And they, yeah, now I can just. <laughs> so like, thank God and everything like that. That's awesome. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I was in the Army and the artillery, and being around that loud noise, I had tendonitis, and my ears ringing constantly, especially when it gets real quiet. It's just, it was sometimes unbearable, but praise God, I'm healed tonight. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. So you have no tinnitus at all anymore. You have no tinnitus at all anymore. No, it's gone. It's gone. I'm healed. Thank Amen. You. Thank you, Lord. Good deal. Uh, uh, when I was young, I was having ear infections all the time, usually six or seven a year, and as a result, never got tubes, and I lost about 50% of my hair in my right ear. So when I would lay down and sleep, I would have to lay on one side in order to hear, and uh, tonight people prayed for me, and uh, I had full hearing in both ears. <laughs> so, uh, I had a martial arts um, injury in my elbow. I hyperextended it and I can move it. It doesn't click anymore. It's been perfectly fine. Wonderful. I had my hearing aids in and, and they, uh, he asked us to take them out and that kind of worried me because I didn't know if I could hear the instructions. <laughs> so anyway, I took them out, put them in my pocket and they prayed for me and I, and he asked, and it was really a step of faith to say that I could. But I got to notice you, and he said, wait a little while. And I noticed I could hear every bit of the instructions <laughs> he gave me. Uh, anyway. uh, the stand. I just, want, I just want to say that I, 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 I'm believing that I'm hearing that good from now on. Yeah. He doesn't take it away. All right. One last time, give a shout of thanks to the Lord. Let's get the team up here. Pastor Paul, uh, let me give it back to you. What we're going to do is we'll have our team down front. We know there's tons of things that we never got a chance to pray for. They will pray for you. And if uh, there's a local team here that wants to help us, please uh, get in line and help us pray for folks. Bless you. See you tomorrow. Sure. Yeah, put your hands out in front of you. Habakkuk has this unusual uh, statement where it talks about the lightnings of heaven that come forth from hands. I realize it's kind of a spooky little phrase, but it's, it's representative of the presence of God that's released in life through touch, through caring for people. Father, I'm asking that you would rest upon, through the Holy Spirit, rest upon us in such a profound way that the lightnings of heaven are released into impossible situations through this body of believers. I pray this for the honor of the name of Jesus. Amen, amen.